Thank you. All right, the other treatment panelists come on up, and you've heard uh, a lot this morning about prevention. You've heard um, from members of uh, the Senate and the House about their advocacy and important work in this matter. Uh, I'm now, I have the honor of uh, moderating and introducing a panel that's going to talk about treatment uh, as a next segment after prevention. I'm going to skip my slides and, in the interest of time, uh, press on and introduce our panel by going broad. Uh, the panelists that follow me will hopefully go deep and, and explore some of these issues in greater detail. Uh, I'm going to subject you perhaps to a quick whirlwind tour of six or seven or eight or, if you let me, 13 different um, aspects of treatment as interventions from youth just to touch on what I think are an idiosyncratic list of important milestones that things that we need to be focused on uh, in, in the interest of youth treatment. First is that substance use disorders and addiction are pediatric problems, are adolescent problems, are developmental problems of youth. So that if you think about the epidemiology of substance use initiation and dependence, you see an ascending limb of increasing incidence, increasing initiation, increased addiction during the second decade of life. And at the end of the second decade, the beginning of the third decade, is where the peak incidences are. So this is a problem of youth. Make no mistake, if this were any other illness, we would be focusing our resources on youth. I won't go as far as to say what some of my colleagues say is that we shouldn't be spending any money on adults. I think that's overkill. But we need to shift our resources and think about where the sweet spot of treatment is, because is that's where the action is. All right, next thing is that the treatment that we do should have developmental specificity, right? Young people are not just short adults. So we need to be thinking about particular kinds of issues of developmental vulnerability that youth have in terms of the emerging teen brain, the emerging teen mind, the emerging teen spirit. What is it about youth that are vulnerable? And how do we intervene there? And also, what do we do that's special for youth in terms of youth specificity of treatment elements that can capture young people, get them into treatment, and figure out what's effective? Next point, treatment is effective. Treatment works. We have clear evidence, emerging science, emerging research that demonstrates there is an evidence base, an expanding and exploding field of knowledge. Treatment works. But, treatment works, but it doesn't work well enough. We need better treatment. As much as treatment is good, it ought to be better. And we need to figure out how to do a better job. But, treatment works, but there isn't enough of it. You heard before the statistic that one in 10, if it's that much, young people who need treatment get treatment. And I don't mean good treatment. I don't mean the right treatment. I don't mean enough treatment. I mean any treatment. That's a shameful statistic. Treatment works, but access and engagement is a big problem. How many teens have you talked to who say, treatment is so fun that that's what I want to do every day? I can't wait to go to treatment because that's going to be my avenue for recovery. Treatment is relatively lame. That's unfortunate. <laughs> we need to do a better job in terms of figuring out how to engage young people in treatment. I sometimes joke that we need a specific Medicaid reimbursement code for pizza. But whatever it is we do, the, tr the, the field has to focus on engagement strategies that can bring young people into treatment, engage them in treatment, and retain them in treatment, because the best scientifically based proven treatments are no good if people don't go to it. Next, families are essential partners. We need families in treatment. And the treatment field as a whole, with exceptions, but as a whole, does a pretty terrible job in engaging families. And that comes in a number of sides. First of all, I hear from families who beat on the doors of treatment centers and say they won't let me in. Uh, the confidentiality issues prevent me from getting access to information. They won't tell me how my young person, my son, my daughter, uh, is doing in treatment. And so we need to engage families 
in terms of the support for recovery and engagement uh, power that they can give to youth. I also have families who won't return my phone calls at the other end of the spectrum. And so the responsibility and the locus of outreach has to be on us as treatment providers and treatment community to try to engage families. Many families come to us at the end of their ropes. I don't know what to do. I'm lost. I'm done with them. You fix them, doc. And so one of the things that the task for family engagement is, is to teach families and rejuvenate them and empower them that they have more juice than they actually know they do and teach them how to use it effectively. Next, as much as we talk about substance use disorders with abstinence as a goal, it's important to think about the broad range of co-occurring problems that go along with substance use. So psychiatric disorders, mental health problems, just as the ascending limb of substance use in the second decade of life is where the action is, one half of psychiatric disorders have onset before age 15 and three quarters before the age of 25. So co-occurring psychiatric problems, mental health disorders are the rule, not the exception. And we have to think about the co-occurrence of mental health problems, functional problems, including depression, disruptive behaviors, delinquency, violence, academic failure, suicide, and have a comprehensive holistic approach, and it's to set ourselves up to failure to think that we can address mental health problems without addressing the co-occurring substance use problems, or to address substance use problems without addressing the co-occurring uh, mental health problems. We need integrated treatment. We need it to go together. Next, you've heard a lot about the opioid epidemic today. I, I don't have to tell you that in every community across the country, young people are dying both of prescription opioid and increasingly uh, heroin overdoses. It's a horrible, tragic problem. Each of us has been touched by that. Uh, each month, I lose patients, and it's a, it's a tragic problem, and I wish I could do better. So we need a focused specialty response on not just substance use disorders and addiction writ large, but a specialty response that addresses the special features of opiates. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of the pharmacological tools uh, and other specialty uh, interventions that we are developing, but it's important that everybody knows there are such things. They're increasingly uh, learning, we are increasingly learning about the use of relapse prevention medications that have been proven in adults. We're still trying to figure out how they work in adolescence and what the best way of using them and promoting them and integrating them with psychosocial counseling treatments, but we need to focus more on that. We need to learn how to do it before we lose more lives, and we need to focus resources on the whole array of tools for opioid addiction, including residential treatment, including longer-term residential treatment, as I said, including relapse prevention medications. Next, marijuana. Nobody dies of marijuana overdoses the way they do of heroin overdoses, but it is a problem. It's on the national scene, and there are clear harms to youth. I think that is incontrovertible. Whatever we say about the civil liberties of adults getting access to recreational youth use, Young people come to harm disproportionately from marijuana, and the impact on youth seems to me to be conspicuously absent from the national conversation. <laughs> Whatever we decide, make no mistake that medicalization and legalization constitute an endorsement from us grown-ups. And whether you agree with that or you don't agree with that, you must be prepared for a wave of increased use that's going to come with increased access, and with increased use, increased use disorders, and with increased use disorders, the attendant problems that vulnerable youth will get. So get ready. Lastly, um, we need a revolution, I believe, in the delivery system. Those of you who are out in the trenches, uh, like I am, doing youth treatment recognize that our delivery system is not up to the task, unfortunately. We've had an episodic, curative, or surgical, if you will, approach, where we put kids in treatment, whether it's residential or outpatient, and expect them to come out the other end fixed, like it was surgery or penicillin. And we don't really have a treatment system that is for longer longitudinal monitoring. We don't have recovery checkups, which we ought to figure out. We don't have good integration into primary care. We don't have a system that can follow kids over time and stay with them as they wax and wane, remit, relapse, drop in, drop out, and support kids and their families through this journey to recovery. 
So I'll quit, and I want to just end with perhaps a call to action. And I, I know the other panelists will come behind me and talk about some of these things in details. But we can do this. But we have to think about a very serious investment of resources and a very serious commitment to really meaning business, because it will not be trivial. Again, we can do this, but we're going to have to invest resources. We're going to have to shift resources to dealing with youth. We're going to have to deal with issues of reimbursement, which are difficult. We're going to have to deal with issues of parity, uh, which are difficult. We're going to have to really mobilize resources. But not to be cynical, I'm very optimistic because I think we're in an exciting time, as you'll hear from the other panelists, in which we're on the verge, I believe, of learning a lot of new tricks of expanding our repertoire, expanding our toolbox, but everybody's got to pull their weight. All right, I'll quit. And with that, I want to introduce Dr. Uh, Joe Lee, who is a friend and colleague from Minnesota. You heard about the land of 10,000 treatment centers, but he's from one very important treatment center, which you've probably heard of, Hazelden, and he's medical director uh, for youth services at the Betty Ford Hazelden Center, and it's a pleasure to introduce him.